All right, so we were considering last time, we got to the point where we were actually considering, well, how did the transfiguration take place? And we proposed a number of possibilities that have been proposed um, <clears throat> by various brethren in times past, including it was a vision by a dream, or related to that, a vision by a, re a realistic presentment. Um, and I think it's Brother Roberts, actually, who phrases that. And I guess in modern terms, we would call that it's like virtual reality. Um, the third option is that it's real, that Moses and Elijah were raised again to be with to, to be <coughs> with Christ at the time. They were glorified with Christ, then they died, and then they died again. Um, and, and then the, the fourth option is it's real, um, but they went forward in time to the kingdom age. So the first two options is the vision. Um, the second two options both say it was actually real, what occurred. Now, last week we we covered a number, uh, quite a, a number of things by background, and that background is important as it's as it helps us to um, to understand the methodology that was involved. And first of all, that we know that it was Christ for the for the joy that was set before him, that he endured the suffering. So. He had a real joy before him, and this joy was given, particularly at the time of the transfiguration, a foretaste of immortality, as it were. And in the context, Jesus stated that the, that the disciples would see the Son of Man in glory and the kingdom of God come with power, that some of them would, would see that before they taste death. So the three, which is Peter, James, and John, who witnessed the transfiguration, that's what they saw. They saw the Son of Man in glory and the kingdom of God coming with power. And Peter, um, as we looked at last week, the whole of his section there in, in Second Peter is based on the events of the transfiguration. And he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made done unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay, so they saw that, you know, in reality. And he goes on in context to talk about it was on the mount, the mount of transfiguration. That's what he's referring to. We also covered that it, the timing of the transfiguration was most likely the day of the atonement, shortly before the Feast of Tabernacles, um, when the high priest, went beyond the veil into the most most holy place where he changed his raiment from the normal clothes he wore to be all linen which both so both going beyond the veil into the most holy place and changing into linen garments entirely linen uh, linen both symbolize a state of immortality and Moses and Elijah were also there we can we talked about the types and as to why they were there last week and they appeared in glory which again is speaking of immortality. Now, one of the, I guess, uh, people who the view that it could be a vision, they rely on Matthew 17, verse 9, which says, tell the vision to no man. Um, now, the word in the Greek is horama, the vision, and Thayer explains there's two senses of this word. The first sense is it's a sight divinely granted in an ecstasy or in a sleep, a vision. Um, and that is the, the sense that we understand many passages in Scripture speak of a vision. So in Acts chapter 11, verse 5, um, Peter explains what was happening before he met Cornelius. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners. Um, so in that case, clearly it was a vision, as we would understand a vision. But the second sense, this word can also mean uh, that which is seen, that which is actually seen, a sight or a spectacle. And so an example here is in Acts chapter 7, verse 30, where it says um, that <clears throat> the, the Stephen here is explaining what happened to Moses. There appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And what, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. So it's the same word, harama. Okay, so this the word can also refer to an actual, something that you, you actually saw. Um, <clears throat> and this sense is supported by the parallel, parallel records 
um, which talk, for example, Mark, Mark 9, verse 9, it refers to the things which they had seen on the Mount of Transfiguration. And likewise, likewise Luke 9, verse 36, those things which, which they had seen. So the language of the Transfiguration is not the language of a dream or a vision. Look at here at Luke 9, verse 32. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, that means fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men stood with him. And if we compare that with Acts chapter, if we can compare that with Acts chapter 10, verse 9 to 10, Peter, when he went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, he fell into a trance. Well, that's very different to being wide awake, isn't it? And also in Acts chapter 12, verse 9, um, it speaks of, again, someone, uh, it, he went out and followed him and wits not that it was true that was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. That's when they were released out of prison. They, uh, they couldn't believe it, but they thought they were dreaming. They thought they saw a vision. And in the case of Acts, um, the Apostle Paul, um, when he was called to come over to Macedonia, a vision. We know this one, a vision appeared to Paul in the night and there stood a man in Macedonia and prayed to him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. So these are clearly dreams or visions. That's not a real experience. But in the case of the apostles, what they saw, they saw the transfiguration when they were fully awake. And I guess this is the key, is that it's not a presentation, it's not a vision, it's not a showing. It's a transfiguration. Jesus was transfigured before him. That's a simple answer to the methodology. Whatever we option we, we might propose, it has to come down to this because this is what the record tells us. Jesus was transfigured before them. Uh, Matthew 17 and Mark 9 both say that. And um, in the case of Luke, Luke's account in Luke 9, verse 29, explains that the fashion of his countenance was altered. So what does transfigured mean? What is, what is the word? Well, in the Greek, the word is metamorphumai. And the idea, and you can see it's used of, of an idea of, of a butterfly going from a caterpillar, the change that takes place to come, to become a butterfly. The idea is a change, meta, of form, morphe. And Bullinger explains it to change into another form, to change into a new condition. The word speaks of a transformation, not merely a change in outward appearance, but a change from the inside first. Something happens on the inside that results in a change. And this is exactly illustrated on the, by the, 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 uh, the caterpillar spinning that cocoon. You can't see it, but something's going on inside. Okay, before the butterfly emerges and comes forth and we see the result. Mm. Um, one Greek scholar, West, says it's the act of a person changing his outward expression from that which he has to a different one, an expression which comes from and is representative of his inner being. Okay, So it's to do with something that it, the change takes place based on the inner being. And the same word occurs in Romans 12, verse 12, and um, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, if you're taking note. For example, Romans 12, verse 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's the same word, transfigured by the renewing of your mind. So that's talking about mentally, there's a change inside of us. Okay, but in this case, Christ, the appearance, the whole countenance externally was changed as well. And also it says he was transfigured before them, okay? So the Greek there is in the sight of one. Again, the, the disciples, as we said before, they were fully awake. So the same idea is in John chapter 12 when Jesus did miracles before them, okay? They were there. They witnessed it. They saw it. And Matthew 5 verse 16, Jesus says to us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So it's real. It's actually occurring. The tr this change that happened to Jesus Christ happened before them. They were awake. They saw it. 
Now, we also look at the key words that were used to describe the change in the three parallel records. There's the repetition of these words, like the sun became white, became full of light, glory. So Matthew 19, verse 2, his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Mark 9, verse 3, his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And Luke 9, verse 22, 29, his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. And Luke, uh, further on in Luke, the next couple of verses, 31 and verse 32, speaking about Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory, were there. And, and they saw his glory. And uh, the Apostle Peter's comment on what he saw in Second Peter chapter 1, for he, that is Jesus, received from God the Father, honour and glory. So these are the words that are used. It's like the sun, dazzling white, brilliant light, the glory. Um, so the, particularly the expression here, for example, white as light uh, or glistening. Um, Luke uh, explains that it's glistening, and that's the word ex exastrapto, and it means to lighten forth. It's from astrapto, which means to flash as lightning. Thayer suggests that the word means to flash out like lightning. And the word occurs in the Old Testament in the Septuagint, um, in the Septuagint Greek version of the Old Testament, to describe the brilliant splendor of the Shekinah glory. And one occasion as well as Psalm 104 verse 2, um, where it speaks about the glory of God, who covereth thyself with light as a garment who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So this is an enormous, powerful, you know, what they saw was, uh, was absolutely enormous. It, it, it echoes what happens on the day of the resurrection, I guess, when, when the angels that stood there in brilliant brightness, you know, just blinded the, uh, the Roman guard that was guarding the tomb. Also, they like the sun. And again, this parallels immortality. When it's referring to, you know, his face did shine like the sun. So there's many quotes in scripture that talk about that, don't they? For example, Matthew 13, verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Daniel 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So this is a figure that's used to describe the immortal state, isn't it? Um, also, white as light, likewise, it parallels immortality. John chapter 20, there's two angels at the resurrection of Christ. In white, the one at the head, um, the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. When Jesus ascended up into heaven, the angels stood them in white, by them in white apparel. Um, and... <clears throat> Of course, the, the promise for us is that those in Revelation there, Revelation 3 and Revelation 19, is those that walk worthy, okay, shall be clothed in white. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white. So again, it clearly is a figure that's used to parallel immortality. And likewise, the expression in glory. We follow that through in scripture, and it's clearly referring to the immortal state. Colossians 3 verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Okay, in the resurrection there, 1 Corinthians 15, speaking about the process of the resurrection, it's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. Luke 24, Christ suffered these things and entered into his glory. There's many quotes we could use that, use to explain that as well or confirm that. So let's summarize what I think the Bible is stating. First of all, the Greek and the narration convey that the transfiguration convey a real impression about the transfiguration. Okay, the word metamorphosis, it's not a dream or a vision. And the you know, context, the description, the very descriptive explanation, like the sun, white, glistening in glory, all speak of the immortal state. Secondly, it was Christ who was transfigured. The disciples were privileged to witness what happened to Christ, 
And by contrast, in the case of Acts 10, Peter fell into a trance and saw a vision. The disciples were wide awake. They saw it. And thirdly, they witnessed Christ in the future because Christ had explained to them that you are going to see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, the kingdom of God come with power. The kingdom of God is what they witnessed, something in the future, the future glory. And we learned that the three disciples were in the first instance heavy with sleep, but they actually woke up to see Christ's glory. So if it were a vision or a dream, we would expect them to remain asleep right, or fall into a trance and then see this. But no, they actually woke up to see this glory, glorious um, spectacle. Um, Luke's account gives a real, Im real impression, doesn't it? Because it says, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who, who appeared in glory. And he goes on to say, Peter, um, when they were awoke, they saw his glory. And later, Peter's reaction, uh, sorry, at the time of the transfiguration, in the middle of it, Peter's reaction was real. He wanted to build three tabernacles on earth for the three glorified beings he saw. And it does not make sense if it were a dream. If it were a dream, he said, okay, this is just a vision, right? This is just a dream. There's no need to build anything. But Peter wanted to build three tabernacles for these three glorious beings that he saw. And then Peter, the apostle Peter later, he explains this in his letter in the second Peter chapter one, verse 16, that the disciples were eyewitnesses of his majesty. As we've already covered, uh, the context in second Peter proves that he's talking about the events of the transfiguration. And such a claim would be false if he saw the glory in a dream. That's not being eyewitnesses of his majesty. He saw it really happen. So because of, because of this, I think we can discount a vision via a dream or a vision in a realistic presentment. I think, to my way of thinking, that the record and the Greek, it's not talking about a vision. It's got to be one of these two options. It's got, it was definitely real. So either Moses, they saw the, the Christ was transfigured and Moses and Elijah were raised to be with Christ, glorified and then died, or it was real in the sense that they went forward in time to the kingdom age. Now, I don't have, you know, there may be other possibilities. There may be other explanations, and I don't want to be dogmatic on this, but so far, from what I can understand and um, read of the scriptures, this makes the most sense to me, that they went forward in time to the kingdom age. But the important thing is, it was real. Christ was really transfigured. He really did get a foretaste of what immortality was like. And Elijah and Moses were there appearing in a state of immortality as well. And so whatever explanation we come up with, we have to work that into it. And I think the best explanation so far is they it was real and they went forward in time to the kingdom age. Now, it's important related to that. It's, uh, it's, it's important to say that God is not bound by time. Time is a law that God has given to, the, to this earth since day one of creation. Now, God sent many laws in place for life on earth when he created for example, the law of gravity, the law of motion, laws of thermodynamics, etc. But time is one of the very first laws he set in place in, on day one, and it's related to the rotation of the earth. Now, of course, God is not bound by this law of time, no more than he's bound by the law of gravity. He's outside of it. He's backstage, as it were, free to move and operate in whatsoever time dimension he wills. And he's not contained by this problem that we are shackled with and neither are the angels okay to do god's will and to direct the affairs of nations time is not a problem for them and so this is <clears throat> so and let's have a look at this from a scriptural point of view because there's a number of scriptural verses that tell us this um, here psalm 90 verse 2 before the mountains were brought forth or as they had the Thou, thou hadst formed the earth and the world from everlasting to 
everlasting. Thou art God. Now we know that. But let's have a look at Hebrews 11, verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Now, the word world there in the Greek, okay, is aeons, which refers to the ages or time. And when it says that the, the ages were, were, were framed, it means were set in order by the word of God. The ISV translation makes this clearer. It says, by faith, we understand that time was created by the word of God. So that what we see is, so sorry, so that what is seen was made from things that are invisible. So God created time. For us, as a law on on the, uh, for our earth, and God is outside of that. Second um, Peter chapter three verse eight, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, often we use this to 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 illustrate that well, seven days, you know, seven days of creation, a thousand years of this, God's seven thousand year plan. One uh, seven days of creation, seven thousand years. But actually, I think Peter is not so much saying that, although we can interpret that from it. But he's got he's got it both ways. So one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So for one day can go really quick with God. That's no problem. It can be like a thousand years, or a thousand years in our point point of view can be just like one day for God. So it, it's saying he's not limited or constrained by time. That's what Peter, Peter, I believe, is conveying in that verse. Isaiah 57 says, For thus saith the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Okay, and I've, a lot of brethren use that in their prayers that so you may have noticed. And it's a wonderful expression to, to refer to our Father, the creator of all things, the God who inhabits eternity. Now, what does that mean <laughs> here in Isaiah 57? He inhabits eternity. Okay, It means he is able to be in all time, all the time. And so Isaiah 46, verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to ha happen in the end because he's not bound by time. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, the New King James Version says, um, who has saved us according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So it just supports that for our creation, for God's purpose with this earth, there was a point when time did begin. That was day one of creation, wasn't it? Likewise, Titus 1 verse 2, in the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. The God's outside of the time, the law of time that he's given to us. And one more quote, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, but we speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, so before time for our glory. So, so again, simple, God is not bound by time. So the concept of them going to a different time zone, going forward in time, okay, is, is, is something that does make sense scripturally speaking, when you understand that God is outside of the law of time that he's given to us. He's not constrained by that. And so it was a transition, I believe, forward to the kingdom itself. Jesus and his apostles were all taken, so to speak, through the time barrier. And it's the kind of experience Paul apparently had also. I should say, obviously, Christ was transfigured, but the apostles remained in a mortal state through that through that process. And it was a phenomenon of divine energy specifically directed. It was miraculous for sure, on par with the conception of Christ and all his miracles. And the disciples would have opened their eyes to a scene of sheer amazement and brilliance. And I believe this explanation resolves all the difficulties as to how Moses and Elijah were there. How could Moses and Elijah be there in glory when Christ hasn't come back yet and they haven't, haven't, you know, the resurrection and the judgment hasn't taken place? If they went forward in time, that resolves that problem. And how could Christ himself foretaste such brilliant glory 
of immortality. Again, I think the main thing here is that the transfiguration was real and Christ was transfigured. He was changed into a, an immortal state. Now, what mountain did they climb? Well, was it a, for the, was it a high mountain? Some suggestions are Mount Tabor or possibly Mount Hermon as well. Um, my personal view, I think it's more likely to, to have they climbed up Mount Nebo. Um, based on the parallel that Moses, that we know, Moses ended his great, great work from Mount Nebo, seeing the land of promise, and was buried by God, very close in that area. And Elijah, likewise, um, he was on the identical mountain, Mount Nebo, when he ended his public ministry. Now, the distance from Caesarea is not a valid objection, as they had six days to travel. Um, so I believe they could have made it down to Mount Nebo, okay, at that time, in six days easily. But then what mountain did they end up on in the transfiguration? And here I think it's interesting because Peter refers to it as this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Is that Mount Nebo? Is it Hermon? Is it Tabor? In the Bible, what what mountain is considered a holy mountain? Normally, it's Sinai, Jerusalem, or Zion. Is not that the holy mount that the Bible refers to? And uh, we know many passages such as Isaiah too. You know that it, it, speaking of that kingdom age when Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and all and shall be exalted above all the hills and all nations shall flow onto it. And it's located at Jerusalem, isn't it? Um, Isaiah 11 verse 9, speaking of the blessings, the wonderful blessings of the kingdom age, it says they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. And Zechariah 8 verse 3 likewise um, <clears throat> speaks about the time when, when Jesus returns when he comes back and dwells in Zion and dwells in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem will be called a city of truth and the mountain of Yahweh of hosts will be called the holy mountain. And that's Mount Zion. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Revelation 21 speaks about the Apostle Paul, uh, sorry, the Apostle John receiving that vision of, of the spiritual city, city of New Jerusalem. He was carried away in spirit to a great and high mountain. Okay, so that, that the holy Jerusalem. So the holy mount in, in Bible is more referring to actually the mountain of Zion, okay, where the kingdom of God will be centered in the future. So what I'm suggesting is not only were they transfigured in time, but space. So they started on Nebo, but the transfiguration when they went through that process, they could have ended up on Mount Zion in the future. Now, um, just a couple of, uh, just in passing, actually, some of our hymns speak about this. For example, hymn 86, we have the words, God of glory, truth and splendor, far exceeding time or space. Okay, so God's not bound by time or space. Hymn 100 as well. Lord of the circling years, Lord of seasons, Lord of time, Lord of space, Lord of seasons and time and space. May your great name be glorified, the Lord of all grace. And one more, this time in our, uh, the, uh, a newer hymn in our orange worship book, um, number 121, worship Yahweh, worship the Lord with all of your heart. All ye nations praise his holy name. Unlimited love to God above, not contained by time or space will rise on eagle's wings and soar with newfound strength so this subject is very interesting and it's our hope as well because once we become angels we'll have this ability we won't be bound by time or space it's it's an entirely different dimension the immortal state it's wonderful it's really something that's exciting to look forward to isn't it Um, now, I mentioned before that the word metamorphumai talks about a change, okay? And, it, and this word in the Greek speaks about a change internally. 
So on the left here, the word metamorphuma, the change to a new condition, right? an internal change, um, an expression based on the inside. And as we see, this is used in the transfiguration account. But in Romans 12 verse 2, be ye transformed in your mind is a mental state. And likewise, in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. So the other two quotes speak about the internal change. But in the case of trans the transfiguration of Christ, it was clearly actually an external change. Now, on the right-hand column, there's another word um, in the Greek, which is um, metaschematizo. I can't say that correctly, but it speaks about the change, the meta or mode of appearance, the schemo. So it's the change it's, this is the word that's used in the Greek to refer to an outward change. Okay, It's something that changes on the outside. And I've got a few quotes to illustrate that. Um, and it refers, you speak, for example, and the main one I want to highlight here is Philippians 3, verse 21, where it speaks about we look for the, our citizenship is in heaven and we look for the return of Christ because he's going to change our nature, our vile nature, to a gl glorious nature. And there's that word in that case, the change to immortality. It's this word, okay, metashimatizo, the external change that is used to describe the physical change in this case. So why the question is, why is the Greek word for an internal change used for what happened to Christ at the transfiguration as opposed to the Greek word for an external change? Well, there's a great lesson here, and as we can see, it's to do with the caterpillar transforming into a butterfly, that Christ, because he ch was different, because he changed on the inside, that was the basis for his external change. So the unblemished character of Jesus is that which was the basis for his transfiguration. It's because of his distinctive character that the words came from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So God was able to raise Christ from the dead and change his nature to immortality based on his internal victory, his victory in defeating the diabolos within himself. And so the internal change occurs before the external change. And so... This is the theme of the, uh, the theme surrounding the transfiguration that Christ was stressing to his disciples, suffering first before glory. Um, and so, as we said before, the two instance, other instances of metamorphumai, the same word that's used for the transfiguration, refer to the internal change we must make. Okay, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8, Okay, we are changed to the same image from glory to glory. It speaks about that, that our character okay, must be changed. Likewise, Romans 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphumai, by the renewing of your mind. And so if we try our best to do this, we will be rewarded with an external change. The, this marvelous transformation will be completed when Christ comes again, as Philippians 3, verse 21, who shall change, now the Greek word for the external change is used, our vile body, that it may be um, fashioned like unto his glorious body. And so in the case of Christ, though, metamorphuma is used because his personal internal victory was the basis for his change to immortality. Our case, we can't do that. Okay, we can try our best to do that internally, but we can't do it perfectly. So that's why this the word the external change is applied to us. Thanks to what Christ achieved in himself in defeating the diabolos, okay, he claimed the victory, and then that victory can be extended to us. And so we we require Christ, therefore, to externally change us to be part of the Son of Man. And this will be achieved by if we continually abide in Christ and we on, on, receive the forgiveness of sins on an ongoing basis. So we have to try 
the lesson of the transfiguration is that in order to be rewarded with immortality, we still have to try our best to follow Christ, to internally change our character. And that's the whole lesson of the Beatitudes, isn't it? Um, the summary of the true disciple of Christ, okay, is, is all these features, poor in spirit. We've got to realize that we, we need help. We can't do it alone. Those who mourn were upset from God's perspective. The meek are those who suppress their ego. They're teachable. They're bold for God. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They live a life where they're looking forward to the return of Christ more than anything else. They long for righteousness in the future. The merciful. Be merciful because you need mercy yourself. Be merciful to others. The pure in heart, abide in the word with sincere motives. The peacemakers, right? Make every effort for oneness with your fellow brother. And finally, expect and endure difficulties as we, as we follow Christ. So we've got to try our best to do this. And if we do this, then when, when Christ comes, then um, we will be rewarded with immortality. We can't do it perfectly, but the example is there for us to follow. Uh, now, briefly in the in the time that remains, I wanted to just highlight one other aspect of the transfiguration, and that is the Son of Man. And if we look at the context of the transfiguration, you'll see that it starts really back in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus asked the disciples, who is the Son of Man? And that's when Peter responds, well, I believe you're the, the Son of the living God, the Christ. And then later, the Son of Man foretells, he began to teach them, he foretells his death and resurrection. Okay? Then we have the transfiguration. And the Son of Man again foretells his death and his resurrection. Okay, so... For example, so Matthew chapter 16, we look at it in the context here. After six days, Matthew 16, verse 13, Jesus taketh Peter, uh, the, and he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Okay, so that was the context. And, you know, Peter answered a wonderful answer at the time, didn't he? He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed art thou, Simon, whom, which means heard, by Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, Petros, and upon this rock, Petra, I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so that, that's the context. Now, the son of the living God, that's how Peter answered, okay? But it doesn't actually explain why, why Jesus died. And so Jesus questions that you're the son of God, right? Christ, the, the son of the living God. But you see, Jesus, from that point in time, was also teaching them about, about the importance of the Son of Man. Now, Peter needed to be given the keys of the kingdom. He didn't have them yet. And the problem of the gates of hell, which is death, the problem that we're all dying creatures, needed to be overcome. And that's what Christ did through his death. And he needed to understand. Um, and so why I mentioned here, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. Well, he's referring, Peter, to the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was three days okay, in the whale or the, the fish. And so likewise, Jesus was going to be in the grave for three days before he was resurrected. So uh, requirements, if you like to be the son of man, it's an important title. The son of man must be born with the exact same fallen nature as those he came to save. In other words, the diabolos within is biased to sin, subject to death, or subject to all the problems, our weaknesses and our sufferings. Also, he must be the son of God at the same time, specially strengthened. He must be sinless, and he must die. 
So that's what he was. That's what Jesus is teaching the disciples both before and after the transfiguration. That he's got to go up to Jerusalem. He's got to suffer. He's got to be died. He's got to be lifted up. He has to put the flesh to death to declare God's righteousness. And therefore, because Jesus is the Son of Man, God resurrected him and gave him immortal life. And God appointed him as our great high priest. And he can sympathize with our weakness. The, the, uh, our sins can be forgiven and we're given the hope of eternal life. And God has given him all authority to be the judge and the ruler of humanity. And so that's why often when the Son of Man title, Jesus refers to him coming back to the earth to judge. It's the Son of Man, okay, sitting on the throne, judging the, judging the world. He doesn't say it's the Son of God although that would be true. See, the son of man means that Jesus, because he met all the requirements to represent us and to represent all of humanity, he is the judge, therefore, and the ruler. And there's one more aspect, and that is that he is the head of the multitudinous son of man. That's Christ and the saints together. Okay, So often when we when we refer that in, in scripture um, to, to visions of, of the kingdom, um, when they saw the Son of Man in his glory, it's not just Christ alone, but Christ coming with all the angels is what they see. And that's what they saw. Um, they saw the Son of Man sitting on the throne in his glory. And... <clears throat> Okay, and so and Matthew 24, um, in the Olivet Prophecy, it says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now, it's not just Jesus alone, but they're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And we, we know that refers to the multitude, the multitudinous Christ, all the saints together with Christ in power and great glory. And so this is parallel, this vision of the Son of Man, and I believe the vision of the transfiguration as well, is parallel with what Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7. He, he, you know, the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne was like fiery flame. Um, Daniel 7, uh, sorry, verse 13 goes on to say, one like the Son of Man. And Daniel chapter 10, verse 6 it says his face was as the appearance of lightning and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So very similar language to what happened at the transfiguration. And it's the voice of a multitude because it's referring to the son of man in a multitudinous form. And the apostle John saw this again. I say again because he was obviously on the Mount of Transfiguration and then the book of Revelation. He saw these these visions as well about <clears throat> the son of man in the future in revelation chapter one the okay, he saw one like unto the son of man he's white as snow okay and again his voice as the sound of many waters representing a multitude and it's the same in revelation chapter 10 verse 1 a similar vision and it's speaking there about the rainbowed angel whose face as it were the sun, like the sun. So there's an interesting aspect about the death, the resurrection, um, and, and the Son of Man appearing in a multitudinous form. Matthew chapter 16, 17, verses 6 and 8, the, the disciples, when they heard it, they fell on their faces. They were sore afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And then when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no, no man save Jesus only. So they went through a process of death. They fell on their faces. There was the resurrection. Jesus came and touched them. And then when they lifted up their eyes, there was only Jesus. Okay? The other, no one else was there. The main thing is Jesus, the son of man. Um, and so Mark conveys the same in Luke, Luke as well. Um, Luke chapter 9, verse 32, first of all, says they were heavy with sleep. That's symbolizing they died. And then they were awake, the resurrection. They saw the glory. And then in the, at the, end, in the end, of, end of the account, when the voice was passed, 
Jesus was found alone. After the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. So Jesus was found alone. So at the end of the vision, we're no longer considering three separate men, just one, the son of man, who's the multitudinous Christ. And Moses and Elijah are included in the son of man. The disciples okay, are to be included in the son of man. And that's our hope, to be included in the son of man. And so there's a number of scriptures that we know talk about that. Um, <clears throat> so, so Christ was crowned with glory and honor. Hebrews 10, 2 verse 10 says he's bringing many sons to glory. He's his work. And so and the apostle Paul to the Thessalonians says, ye are ye in what is our hope, our joy or crown of rejoicing? Is not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So he's, he's referring to the vision of Christ and the saints all together with all the Thessalonian brethren and sisters there in glory, a multitude in its cry. That's his hope. That's his joy. That's his crown of rejoicing. And uh, we've looked at Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, which speaks about the Son of Man one like unto the Son of Man in the midst of the seven candlesticks, which is prophetic of the multitudinous Christ. So again, our hope is to be included in this Son of Man. And with that in mind, the lesson, I think, is that we should hear his voice because that's the voice that came from heaven, isn't it? During the transfiguration, while he yet sank, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So let's listen to his voice. Let's value the inspired word of God above everything. Let's pattern our whole life on the guidance of his word. Don't reject what Jesus says, even when, when it challenges us to do something that we personally may you know, dislike or feel uncomfortable about. Let's listen to his, his voice and accept okay, the way of salvation, the suffering and the glory. And how with respect to both doctrine and our moral way of life. Because if we follow what he says, if we listen to his voice, don't listen to what the world says, listen to what he says, then it's reliable. And we too have the hope of appearing in his glory. So let's listen to his voice. Let's follow his, the example of Jesus Christ who came not to please himself, but to suffer and, and give his life for us. And if we do that, okay, then the day star, star will arise in our hearts as well. One day we will be transfigured externally, internally and externally into that wonderful state of immortality. So in conclusion, I guess the big theme here of the transfiguration is suffering before glory. The transfiguration showed a transformation of Jesus into the son of man, coming, which is a title, as we've discussed, of him coming in his kingdom. The apostle Paul shows that we must try our best to internally change now in order to be externally changed when Christ will return and then we will receive the same glory. And this is part of being a living sacrifice now. We must suffer. We participate in Christ's sacrifice. So as Colossians 3 verse 4 says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. Okay? So because we've got that wonderful hope of glory, what do we have to do? It says in verse 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And... Uh, Again, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. What is our hope, our joy, or our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye, are not all of us, brethren and sisters, this is what the Apostle Paul's looking to, forward to, when we all have received immortality and are there together in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Mm -hmm.